Hey everyone, this lecture is about retrieval. Um, and retrieval, broadly speaking, is a framework um, that's useful for a lot of different problems. And so, for example, next class, we'll see how entity disambiguation, where we take mentions of entities and disambiguate them against the knowledge base, can be framed as a retrieval problem. Later, we'll see how record linkage and OCR can be framed as retrieval problems. Um, and so retrieval is really ubiquitous um, when it comes to solving problems. Um, but in particular today, we're going to be talking about, you know, the, the heart of the retrieval literature, which is open domain text retrieval, where we query over a very large body of text to find the answer to a question. Um, for background, we're going to start by introducing reading comprehension, which is a pretty straightforward problem where the aim is to find the answer to a question within a predefined passage. And then we'll go to uh, open domain retrieval, where we want to find the answer to a query over a potentially very large database like the internet or Wikipedia. Um, and then after introducing retrieval and open domain retrieval, we will consider a particularly prominent recent application of retrieval, which is retrieval augmented language modeling. Um, and I'm going to be breaking this lecture up into three separate videos. Uh, there'll be the question answering part, uh, the open domain retrieval part, and the retrieval augmented language modeling part. You know, I recorded this once and then within like a minute of finishing what is quite a long lecture, my computer crashed and uh, the video apparently cannot be salvaged and is corrupted. So in case that happens again, I am going to be breaking this up into three shorter parts. And so be sure to watch all of them uh, for class on Tuesday. All right, so the first part is about question answering. Um, and so reading comprehension is how to answer questions over a single passage of text. So you have a question, you have a passage, what is the span of tokens in that passage that answers the question? Open domain question answering is how to answer questions over a large collection of documents. And so you don't know which of these many documents has the answer to your question. So obviously the latter is more practical, um, but the former is the easier problem. And so we're gonna talk about that first. And so question answering um, is um, something that there's been interested in for a long time. And so the earliest computer system to answer questions dates all the way back to the 1960s. Obviously question answering has enormous commercial applications. Uh, people ask their smart speakers questions, they ask Siri questions, um, they ask uh, chat questions, etc. So this has just you know huge commercial app uh, applications. Um, and so today, almost all question answering systems use a pre-trained language model like BERT. Um, and so reading comprehension, the problem of answering a question given that you know, you, given that you have a specific passage, um, means that you're going to take a passage and you're going to take your query and you're going to find the answer. Um, and so reading comprehension is an important benchmark for evaluating how well language models understand human language. I have a quote here all the way back uh, from a, a famous linguist in the 1970s. Uh, Since questions can be devised to query any aspect of text comprehension, the ability to answer questions is the strongest possible demonstration of understanding. All right, um, so the best known question answering benchmark is called SQUAD. Um, it has 100,000 annotated passage question answer triples. The passages are 100 to 150 tokens selected from US Wikipedia. The questions are crowdsourced uh, and each answer is a span of text. So what's the span of tokens in the passage that answers the question? So obviously this is a limitation, not all questions can be answered in this way, but this is how question answering has traditionally been conceived. Um, squad is essentially solved and that state of the art exceeds human performance. All right, so squad you can have you can evaluate based on having an exact match or F1, which gives you partial credit if you get part of the span correct. Um, squad has three gold answers um, and three answers were corrected because there could be multiple plausible answers, multiple plausible spans of text that answer the question. Um, and um, to evaluate performance, compare the predicted answer to all three gold answers and take the max. Um, and so how do we build a model to solve squad? Well, 2016 to 2018, people used LSTM models with attention. 
2019 to 2021, uh, fine-tuning BERT and BERT-like models. Um, so this is BIDAF, um, Bidirectional Attention Flow Model, which is one of the most prominent LSTM models that was used uh, to approach question answering. We're not going to go into the details of how it works. You can see that it gets a little bit involved. Um, whereas BERT, uh, we've seen this before. So you have pre-training, self-supervised pre-training of BERT, and then you have fine-tuning on labeled data like SQUAD. Um, and um, so essentially, um, you're just predicting the start token and the end token to the answer span to your question, and you jointly embed the query and the passage with a separator token between them in BERT, and that allows you to have full cross-attention between your query and your passage, um, and then your output of BERT is just, it's a token level output where you're predicting the start of the answer and the, the, the span of text of the answer to the end of the answer. Um, and um, so all BERT parameters, as well as the newly introduced parameters that tell where you start and end uh, the passage are optimized together. As you see, BIDAF has an F1 of about 77, which is well below human performance. Um, whereas with Roberta, you know, XLNet, Albert, you're up to um, exceeding human performance. Um, and so essentially, um, this is a solved problem, at least, you know, for the benchmarks we have, if you train on that benchmark, um, the model can perform better than humans on that target data. Um, so what makes BERT better than BIDAF? Um, well, this is, you know, the same, <laughs> the same theme that we've seen earlier in the class. So BERT has many more parameters. Uh, BIDAF is an LSTM and has 2.5 million parameters. BERT large has 330 million. Uh, why does BERT have so many more parameters? Well, BERT can be parallelized because it's built on transformers, um, whereas um, you can't parallelize the training of an LSTM. It's, you can train BERT for much longer and much more data and have a larger model. Um, BERT is pre-trained while BIDAF is only built on top of GLOVE and all the remaining parameters need to be learned from supervised data sets. So being able to have self-supervised pre-training makes a big difference to model performance. And this is just a general uh, lesson that's going to come up um, over and over again. All right, um, BIDAF is a seek-to-seek -seek model that models the interaction between question and passage, whereas BERT is going to use self-attention over the concatenation of the question and passage. So in BIDAF, the question can attend to the passage, um, but BERT has self-attention within the question, within the passage, and then also full cross-attention between them because it's just jointly embedding them. Um, and so it's been shown that adding a self-attention um, layer for the passage attention to BIDAF also improves performance. And so the self-attention ingredient in BERT is, is also important. Um, you know, as is often the case with supervised tuning, which again is gonna, a theme in this course, um, you know, supervised training doesn't necessarily generalize um, across, across data sets. Um, and you know, so you do you 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 get a certain amount out of the self-supervised training of BERT, and then you can beat human performance by training on your target data, but that doesn't necessarily generalize. You know, and maybe there's some level at which we wouldn't expect to if there's idiosyncrasies in this data and how is the model gonna learn them if it wasn't kind of tuned to learn those idiosyncrasies. Um, but you know, this is again gonna be a theme. If you really wanna beat human performance, often that times that comes from giving a precise definition of what you want to do by doing supervised training on your target data. Um, and so when we discuss retrieval augmented language models, we will see how the generative capacity of very large language models has been leveraged for question answering, uh, which is going to come full circle with our previous discussion of prompting. All right, so that's question answering. Um, and now please remember to go to the video on open domain retrieval and question answering, um, and also on retrieval augmented language models. Um, but I'm gonna upload this one before my computer crashes again and uh, disappears with it, um, and then record a separate video for that.